This is Putin's war on Talk TV. I'm Mike Graham, and it's our weekly look at what's happening in Ukraine, how the Russians are reacting to it, and what the rest of the world is saying. I'm joined as ever by Hugh Andre. Uh, there's been a bit of a change of direction, it seems, from um, Moscow's point of view. They've started to attack Kiev a little bit more this week. They've started firing missiles and, and bombarding more civilian targets, really. Mm. What have they been doing? Yeah, this um, last Saturday, the Russians claim that they, uh, one of their vessels in the Black Sea was hit by a, a maritime drone. Uh, and I think we have some footage to, to show that, mm. uh, which, of course, immediately uh, created a reaction uh, from Putin. Uh, something we'll talk about later is his suspension of the grain agreement. We'll mm. come on to that. But the reaction that, uh, that it attracted was... Uh, wave after wave of long-range missile attacks. Right. Although, dare I say it, uh, this time a little bit more strategic. Uh, it was all about hitting critical infrastructure. Mm. So he was hitting uh, electric uh, power generation plants, yeah. hydroelectric water plants, you know, and other relevant infrastructure. So effectively trying to cut off communities, really. Um, the argument really is that winter's coming. And the idea of... Uh, hitting power stations and hydroelectric plants is it will diminish the morale of the local people. Yeah. Now, I know that um, the mayor of Kyiv um, came out saying that 80% of his consumers' uh, water uh, uh, supply being cut off, uh, as well as um, 350,000 homes have been left without power. Mm. Interestingly... Two days later, both those numbers had halved, right. which just goes to show how how effective they've become mm. at, at reconnecting yes. power and water. But ultimately, it's really about trying to uh, reduce the morale of the people with, with winter coming. Mm. Yeah, trying to make out that, you know, you're going to be under siege, basically, for the rest of the, the winter months and you're never going to know whether you're going to have water or power. Yeah, which is it's more effective than hitting schools yeah. or hospitals. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, of course, as we've seen, um, and as Boris Johnson spoke about last night, in uh, the, 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 the morale of the people, every time he does this, it, it just strengthens yeah. their morale yeah. and increases you know, their desire to see an independent, free Ukraine again. Yes. It doesn't seem to be any um, shortage of, of people willing to fight for that as well, whereas on the Russian side, you know, we're seeing quite a lot of people not willing to fight for their cause as well. So let's talk a bit about Boris Johnson's interview because there's quite a few ramifications that have come from that, aren't there? Yeah, I mean, this has all been about the sort of the nuclear uh, narrative which uh, Putin has been discussing. And uh, I won't make any apologies here to those viewers who've commented on the, the there isn't a Soviet Union. Mm. They're absolutely correct, but the Soviet military doctrine and strategy is one that Putin mm. adheres to. Right. You know, it, it, it's as old as the hills now, but much like their kit and equipment, it hasn't changed yes. much. And, and that, that, that's old Soviet doctrine. It, it ebbs and flows with uh, effectively what's happening on the ground. Mm. When we see Putin's missiles reaching their targets, when we hear that his forces are advancing, that n nuclear narrative diminishes. Mm. As min the minute he's on the back foot and 44 of his 50 missiles are, are actually taken out of the skies, yeah. the narrative goes up. But I think what viewers must understand is 60 years ago, literally, just passed, mm. we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. After that event, the US, um, the, the Pentagon, uh, NATO and the Russians agreed that going forward, where nuclear missiles were concerned, there would be protocols. Mm. There was effectively a messaging system. Right. Um, a nuclear missile isn't just going to go off without anyone knowing. And actually, a couple of weeks ago when the Soviets test-fired uh, some nuclear missiles, they actually advised the US and NATO that they were going to do those trials. So that messages, messaging system so they're sort is of still keeping, working. So they're keeping within the protocol as oh, such. Absolutely. And be under no illusion, you know, there are diplomatic back channels in place for the US, 
for NATO and for Russia to discuss mm. what is happening right. on that front. And would those conversations include conversations about, um, you know, what's been what have been described before as tactical battlefield nuclear weapons? The, 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 I know you've said to me they're not mm. really that much smaller. It's just a matter of where they um, where they where they are aimed and what what their purpose is. I mean, would there be a different protocol for that? Or is it all under the same umbrella? Well, the whole point is we don't know. Mm. Um, and there's only a, you know, a handful of individuals who do know yeah. um, what they are. What certainly I believe, listening to a variety of uh, intelligence services, is they're not concerned. Mm. And, and what does Putin have to gain by doing that? And we've mm. spoken about this before. He has very few allies. Um, and if he was to engage and use uh, nuclear uh, weapons, dirty or not, he would certainly lose most of those. Mm. And there are also numerous nations around the world currently sat on the fence, undecided on whether they'll support him or not. Mm. He would most certainly put them off yeah. in supporting him. Yeah. So the threat as such that we've spoken about in the last couple of weeks hasn't changed, but it hasn't increased, which I suppose is a good thing. I, maybe it's, it's increased marginally, mm. but I don't think to an extent that you know, anyone needs to be worrying um, uh, about it. I think Putin's hands are full at the moment with um, his own internal messaging, mm. his own influencing internally, and what will be the, uh, the, the long-term outcome mm. What we're seeing at the moment are small marginal gains, small marginal losses being made uh, in the wet autumn period prior to the winter arriving. Uh, my, my own personal belief and those who I speak to is that certainly Ukraine will look to try and retrake Carson before that winter period. Yes. And, and Putin might be quite happy to give up that position in order to withdraw across the Dnipro River and establish uh, fortified defensive mm. positions. Right. Because let's not forget, he's he's still low on manpower. Mm. He's he's low on resources. He's got three hundred thousand um, new recruits, based pr primarily in Belarus and Russia, who are still waiting to be. And it's going to be, be winter for everybody, isn't it? So moving people, troops, machinery, vehicles is not going to be easy anyway. No, no, it won't be. Um, and he's got to effectively look at his logistics and his supply lines. Um, and I think that's why digging in on the eastern side of the river uh, and perhaps sacrificing Carlson uh, would be actually um, to his advantage. The, the ultimate question is, where is it all going to end? Can a deal be mm. done? But I'm not sure there is a deal to be done at the moment. No. And so we enter November, really, with no great expectation that if we sit here a month from now, as we enter December, much will have changed. I don't think it will. Um, ultimately, Putin, and uh, you look at the propaganda machine internally in Russia, mm. what we have to remember, he can, he can create any deal he wants. He can go and tell the mm. people of Russia that he's done X, Y and Z mm. and they will believe him. Yes. Um, the real question is, Will Zelensky and the people of Ukraine want to deal? Mm. And m my feeling is that Crimea will probably have to remain in its current state, although Ukraine would obviously like that back. But I can't see him arriving at any table where there's a discussion around the, the newly annexed territories remaining under Russian control. No. I think he'll want those back. Right. And the other pressure that will come, I suppose, in the next month or so, as the reality of inflation bites in the West, is how much more money the West is willing to pay towards yes. the fight for, for, for Ukraine's freedom. Yep. Um, there's the economic factors that this war's having. Mm. Um, you may remember back in July, uh, Putin agreed to uh, allow grain, for example, Ukraine's, Ukraine's single biggest export. Mm. Um, the only problem is it has to leave Baltic ports to cross the Baltic Sea. And, yeah. um, an agreement that was brokered by uh, both the UN and Turkey between Ukraine and Russia 
uh, allowed for those ships to leave. Last Saturday, Putin put a stop on that. Mm. Um, although he hasn't said that it's permanent, he has said that it's uh, 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 an immediate mm. cessation, that Ukraine will be responsible for their own protection. Personally, I think this is to, again, give him some leverage mm. to negotiate uh, on the basis of allowing some of Russians' exports to go ahead mm. in return for grain yeah. to be exported. Interesting. Well, um, we remain um, fascinated by what's going on. We'll bring you all the details uh, as they come in to us. Uh, Hugh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that is Putin's war. This is Talk TV. I'm Mike Graham. We'll see you next week. Thank you.